All right, thanks, Jay. So in the um, spirit of recovery month, I wanna show a brief video. It's the trailer for a documentary that's coming out that's about um, actually our first peer recovery support specialist that we have for Healthy Connections and her mother, um, who ironically was my doula. So things like that really kind of only happen in West Virginia, but um, it's exciting when it does happen. So I'm gonna try to share that first. All right, are folks seeing a video, what appears to be a video clip? Yep. All right, I'm going to hit. Oh, are you still there, Jen? Okay, here it yeah. goes. Okay. As ever, um, substance use disorder for many years, I'm doing whatever I had to do to get my next fix. And I still could not admit that I had a problem. Um, it wasn't until June 14th of 2016 when I gave birth to my daughter, who is actually here now, showing her in the stroller. Um, when I had her, it was the most miserable day of my life. And I say that because she was diagnosed with NAS, um, neonatal asthma syndrome. Um, I thought that I was not capable of being a mother, and I thought that I would never be capable of being a mother. Um, I then went on to treatment because I realized that having a child and not being able to care for her was the greatest pain that I have ever felt, and I knew that I had to do something different. Mommy. And a mommy. Yeah, I was looking for her, and I found a dog, and it's a female dog, and the dog was hurt and hardly breathing. So I waited a couple of days, and I had to go see if she was still there. And I went, she was still there. She was alive, but barely. And then I remember it so vividly, and to my left, came a bunch of puppies that were just random puppies, not a little one litter. They were just all random puppies, and they were all trying to get to her like they wanted something from her. Was she told me that everybody needed a piece of her to the point that they had put her on a pedestal, and she just didn't have it to give them. And that it was too hard to be perfect. All right, so um, Ashley worked with us for two years. Um, she had two years of sobriety before coming to Healthy Connection. Um, as we say uh, in the documentary, she had gone through the whole process of um, getting sober after having her daughter who um, was diagnosed with NAS. And um, while she was with us, she got pregnant again. She was very happy. Um, but eventually had a um, reoccurrence and uh, passed away from a uh, drug overdose. The reason I wanted to start with this, not just because it's recovery month, and I think it's important for us to kind of um, keep in mind how serious this issue is, um, but also to really illustrate how tumultuous the period surrounding pregnancy, um, the postpartum period, uh, raising an, an infant and a toddler can be a lot of ups and downs. So when I talk about transitions today, I'm talking about all those various uh, transitions that our patients experience, whether that's going from a general outpatient program to a pregnancy specific program, or after um, you know being receiving obstetric care to being kind of discharged to just you know normal patient, um, to graduating, to taking a baby home, all of that stuff.
All right. So transitions of care, as I mentioned, they can apply to um, you know, mean lots of different things for our moms. Um, the specific things that I want to emphasize today are um, three reasons. I'll talk about more than three, but uh, you'll discover at least three reasons why the postpartum period is risky for mothers in early recovery. Um, two, the importance of keeping mother and baby together during treatment. And three, uh, what is the plan of safe care and how is that um, implemented in West Virginia? Um, I wanted to uh, bring everyone's attention to this article from 2018 by um, Dr. Schiff and her team at Massachusetts General. Um, unfortunately, we don't have data um, this specific about West Virginia, but I think it illustrates something very important. So uh, the blue here represents um, both fatal and non-fatal overdose rates at different uh, time points in pregnancy and postpartum period for women combined, both women who are in um, and not um, receiving MAT during pregnancy. And you'll see that although in the second and third trimester risk for overdose reduces, um, you see an uptick by seven to nine months. And that's this is for women who are both uh, receiving and not receiving MAT combined. And in figure B here, what you see is that when you divide that out, um, this is even more startling for women who are not on pharmacotherapy. So the gray bars represent um, the uh, fatal and non-fatal overdose rate for women who are not on pharmacotherapy. And you see um, it's a pretty steep increase at that uh, when the baby is seven to nine months old. And although we don't know um, the exact numbers um, for West Virginia, we can make some inferences based on what we do know. So um, combined um, 2016 to 2020 data, we know that in Western West Virginia, so this is, um, I believe, uh, Charleston and Huntington were both included in that, um, maternal death rate of about 145 and a half per 100,000 compared to the national average of 20 per 100,000 um, live births, I believe is how that's um, measured. And statewide uh, overdose is uh, a, basically could be attributed to a third of all maternal death causes. So why does risk uh, for moms increase in the postpartum period? Um, after all, if uh, we've been uh, creating these systems of care in which mom starts receiving treatment um, during pregnancy and has all of these great wraparound services and effective medication management, uh, why is this postpartum period so tricky? Well, there are numerous reasons. So um, the first I'll mention are access to care issues. And in West Virginia, I will say that one, one way we are um, blessed as a state is that uh, we do have Medicaid um, and, and most Medicaid uh, will apply to moms even after pregnancy. So they'll be able to continue to access care after pregnancy and that's not the same in, in every state. Um, but there can be issues with access to care in, in that um, moms after they've delivered a baby may not necessarily be able to find the same uh, transportation or find childcare to make it to appointments, um, to be maybe not want to take their baby to the methadone clinic, for example. Um, they are less likely to be getting frequent checkups as they are during pregnancy. And so it may be difficult for folks that are working with them to determine when they need a little bit of extra help. Whereas during pregnancy, um, you know, we expect to see them at pretty regular intervals. And if they're not there, someone's calling to check on them. Uh, postpartum depression, which um, our patient population is uh, have increased risk of, of having postpartum depression. Uh, postpartum depression or activation of uh, underlying bipolar disorder, um, or uh, we, you know, we call it postpartum depression. It can also manifest as anxiety. Um, these are all things that can um, increase risk for relapse or return to use. In addition to normal postpartum stress, so things like not sleeping well, not 
be able to take care of yourself, not bathing, not seeing another adult for 72 hours at a time. Um, these are all things that our moms are going through as well. And the cascade of stressors that can come um, from our patient population. So for example, uh, financial stressors related to not being able to work, um, relationship stressors that might be heightened after the birth of a child and CPS involvement. Trauma reactions that can be activated after delivery, um, particularly if mom has a history of um, CPS and including removal or termination of parental rights in the past, um, then even a very benign interaction with CPS can be very emotionally challenging for them. And in some cases, tolerance. So if mom's not on uh, medication during her pregnancy, uh, but was absent during that entire period, um, and if she resumes use after an extended period of not using, um, she's at, at high risk for overdose if she does have a reoccurrence. And don't forget stigma. You might have froze, Jen. Oh. Yeah, okay. You switch you your me? back. Yeah, That's you're back right. now. Yep. Sure. So the belief that a substance using pregnant woman is failing to protect an innocent other and thus deviating from the social norms surrounding motherhood positions the woman as an adversary of the developing fetus. And although we may do our best not to convey that to moms, they will experience that at some point. Uh, if not in our office, um, at, at some point they will interact with someone who sees them as um, their uh, interests being diametrically opposed to those of their baby. Your postpartum patient is likely in pain, likely still bleeding, leaking milk, or worried about her milk coming in, feeling overwhelmed, emotionally labile extremely guilty, not sleeping well, hungry, tired. She may be yearning to hold her baby, particularly if her baby's uh, being kept for treatment and she's discharged. Um, and she may act in ways that seem like she's not interested in her child. And um, I think it's important for us to realize the psychological state that our, our patients are in when we have expectations for them to, uh, you know, uh, be at, at meetings at, you know, exact times and uh, travel to different locations to get services. Um, they're really going through a lot. Um, Thankfully, we've, we've had several sessions where we've talked about the different adjunctive services, therapy techniques, um, what the content and structure of a, a psychotherapy, group psychotherapy should look like. Um, but what else can we do? Well, it can be as simple as instilling hope. So mothers have in the back of their mind that that feeling that they've done something to harm their child, even if they've made the right choice, for example, by uh, seeking out medication assisted treatment. So by letting them know that um, there are success stories out there, um, teaching patients self-advocacy, both their rights and responsibilities to educate our patients about the particular delivery hospital, um, what, what their visitation hours are, uh, what they're allowed to ask for, what's expected of them. To be that annoying person with the badge. So not only to make referrals for patients, but also uh, if, if it... If hey, Jen, you keep freezing up. Maybe turn off your video and see if that makes it go a little bit smoother and then turn it back on when we do the Q&A. There you go. Okay. All right, so um, instill hope, uh, teach patients self-advocacy, their rights and responsibilities at the particular delivery uh, hospital where they will be, um, to be that annoying person with the badge that um, and also to engender you know, a culture shift 
within our health system uh, to not see uh, moms as this, you know, adversary of the fetus, but but actually the most important part of the of the um, substance exposed newborn's recovery. Part of that is keeping mother and baby together. Specifically, I'm going to talk about rooming in, um, which is having um, pre pre pretty much mom. I I've not seen any programs that allow fathers to room in, um, but uh, having mom uh, in the same room as baby while baby is receiving treatment for NES. Uh, benefits of rooming in are for mom, better quality sleep, um, it promotes bonding, improves breastfeeding experience, gives more opportunity to learn infant cues and early feeding cues, increased confidence in handling and caring for their baby, um, decreases in baby blues and postpartum depression, and helps ease the transition to home. Um, I'll add what I notice um, anecdotally with my patients is that it also enhances their motivation for their recovery as well. They are really able to not only uh, you know, rationally understand why they're doing this, but also affectively to, to feel why they're doing this when they get to have that time with their child. There are also numerous benefits for baby. Better quality sleep, generally more content, less crying, lower levels of stress hormones. Uh, they tend to be able to initiate breastfeeding sooner, longer, more easily, uh, more availability for skin-to-skin -skin contact if mom is available around the clock. Um, I have a couple of stars uh, here for these last two items because um, although we do have see some evidence in the research that there are a uh, lower need for pharmacotherapy for withdrawal symptoms and shorter lengths of stay. So those two findings come from this meta-analysis um, from 2018. 2020, um, Paul et al. Um, re uh, reviewed kind of the uh, rigorousness of the studies that we have. And in fact, we, we don't have a lot of high quality uh, research, including randomized control trials uh, to determine whether uh, Ruby in, uh, you know, actually is able to replace pharmacotherapy. Um, however, expert guidance is that um, overall it improves experience for both mom and baby, even when um, medication is still indicated for the, the newborn. What are barriers to keeping mom and baby together? Um, although this is something that I'm, I'm happy to say I, I'm seeing phase out a bit, institutional policies tend to be the biggest barrier, um, both at the NAS or NAUS treatment facility. So in the past, it's um, not always been um, the different facilities that are treating the baby have not always um, been able to treat mom because of space issues, staffing issues, um, being able to monitor what's going on. Um, fortunately, in our area, both of the facilities that treat babies for now in Cabell County, the neonatal therapeutic unit, and also Lily's Place do allow rooming in of, of uh, mom and baby. Um, but also where we see um, separations occurring are in um, substance use disorder treatment facilities. We um, are, again, fortunate in Cabell County to have Project HOPE which allows moms um, and babies to uh, reside together during mom's treatment. Um, however, we have a, a limited number of beds uh, for that program. And when we have had need to refer moms out of our health system to other um, facilities, they're not always able to bring the newborn with them or even visit regularly. And that can be a, a, a big uh, opportunity for a stumble for mom um, trying to cope with those emotions uh, that come from separation from their baby. Um, even when um, having rooming in is available, um, sometimes mom has other children or responsibilities, um, often a barrier for us if mom is not from Cabell County, if she um, 
had to, to travel quite a distance to deliver here. Um, and then she has responsibilities back at home. Transportation is also a barrier to her getting back and forth to be able to make the most of visitation. Um, in some ways, Ruby Ann can alleviate that by giving her a place to stay overnight. But then if she has uh, children, work, et cetera, um, that, that's still, um, she still can't uh, take full advantage of that opportunity. And also unsafe, unsafe sleep can be an issue, uh, particularly with this population. This is something that we've noticed um, just in terms of uh, looking at safe sleep in our facility that um, a lot, oftentimes moms that have a history of substance use disorder um, maybe co-sleeping co um, particularly in, a, in an unsafe way. So uh, while seated and, and things of that nature. So um, safe sleep education tends to be a big need for our patient population. Plan of safe care. So where did the plan of safe care originate? In 2016, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act uh, was updated to the, the form we know now, which requires reporting of uh, substance exposed newborns. Um, the particular change that occurred in 2016 is that the specifier illegal substance abuse and withdrawal, uh, illegal was taken out. And so um, any evidence of substance abuse or withdrawal in the newborn or fetal alcohol syndrome so I, even if the child, uh, mom and child do not test positive at delivery, um, but there are the um, physical markers of FAS that would also um, meet criteria for uh, reporting under the 2016 cap though. And um, a bit uh, later in the same year, the CARA Act uh, established the requirement that these families um, where prenatal substance use is detected, um, that the plan of safe care that is developed for the families are required to offer treatment to the parents. And the states were given um, the opportunity to decide for themselves how they were going to, to meet these criteria. West Virginia, um, our Child Protective Services policy updated in 2019 to, to um, meet both of these uh, with CAPTA and CARA um, defines, uh, instead of using the term substance, uh, substance abuse or withdrawal of infants, um, they use the term drug affected infants and healthcare providers that detect um, drug, drug, drug affected And under West Virginia policy, if CPS de decides to open a case and uh, do an in-home or out-of-home safety plan, that safety plan is then considered to be the plan of safe care um, required by CAPTA. It's a bit more vague if a, if a safety plan is not put into place. Um, Um, but our state policy is very open-ended as to what that can look like. Um, but it, there is a burden on CPS to make some sort of assurances that the family is receiving necessary services. And also CAPTA requires that the states look into whether localities are already providing those um, services for families. what might be included in a plan of safe care in West Virginia. Um, so this is quoted, uh, taken directly from our state CPS policy, um, a protection plan, safety plan, and safety services could be drug or alcohol assessment and treatment, medication assisted treatment, a mental health assessment, psychological or psychiatric evaluation, counseling, alcohol art, uh, unspecified home visitation, although those two are both uh, considered home visitation programs, medical services, and education on safe sleep practices and drug-affected infant needs. I have a star next to birth to three because it, that is re a required referral 
um, for any child that is um, considered to be a drug affected infant in West Virginia. And that referral as the CPS, the burden is on CPS to make that referral, although we do recommend um, that medical providers who have the opportunity to facilitate those types of referrals do take advantage of that. So how do we support our patients knowing that um, they're, they're going to go through this process and that they're going to be expected to have a, a plan of safe care, uh, regardless of whether or not they have uh, an open CPS case. We try, um, when at all possible, to have candid discussions about CPS, um, both in our pregnancy program and if, if mom was not in a program during pregnancy, we try to have those conversations um, early on. Um, we So if they have to have some kind of uh, family member supervising, who do they want that to be? Um, if they are required to go to therapy, where do they want to go to therapy? Um, if they're required to receive uh, parenting classes, and are they already receiving parenting classes? Try to help them organize that information. Um, we ensure that they have adequate support outside of treatment. In our health system, we use that through um, PRSS and um, also through um, mutual support programs in the community. Um, during any uh, recovery support, um, so if the person's receiving family navigation services or care coordination, um, we offer them practical and emotional support in completing their case plan. We, we make sure if you are asked to do A, B, and C, let's see how we can uh, remove barriers to you doing A, B, and C. Um, assess or refer for residential treatment as needed. Um, at times when um, uh, maybe patients have had a, a long period of time of doing well and have a recurrence and are then expected to go to residential treatment, um, and that uh, it can come as a surprise uh, to patients who, you know, objectively have been doing pretty well, um, but we, you know, try to make that as, as painless as possible. And um, we try to communicate and coordinate at these treatment junctures where there are transitions. So um, when at all possible, we try to communicate if they are gonna be leaving one program um, to go to another, we try to make sure that that is as smooth as a uh, process as possible. We try to make sure that any records that they might need for CPS or for their future program, that they, they have a copy of those. Um, and what uh, something that we've been working on doing within our health system that's it's a bit new, um, but something that we're really working to improve is also when moms are transitioning out of residential treatment, um, how can we make sure that uh, they still have support and that someone is checking on them and following up after they leave residential treatment as well. Um, if you are not familiar with this manual already, I. Um, Highly recommend um, chasing it down online. It's free. Optimizing care of the mother baby dyad affected by substance use disorder. Um, primary author is Sharon Heseltine. Um, she also does a, a training course uh, to train and specifically mother baby dyad care. Um, it's excellent. I've, I've taken the first half of the training. Um, they also, through the state of Kentucky, offer opportunities to become a trainer. I have not done that part yet, but um, I think that's a really great opportunity if you have um, support staff in your healthcare system to get them trained um, specifically uh, working with uh, this population. Okay, and I'm going to... Um, open the floor for any questions. Thanks, Jennifer. We appreciate it. Um, feel free to unmute, raise your hand, use the chat. I know there was some in and out there throughout the session. So if you have clarifying questions, please ask them. We did have one question in the chat, Jennifer. It was from Dr. Baltiera. 
about where is the maternal mortality rate coming from? Uh, specifically for West Virginia? Yes, because um, it's really hard and the CDC is blanked out because the numbers are too small. And that just, I mean, I know we've got problems, but maternal mortality isn't necessarily our worst problem unless we, we're missing a bunch of overdoses. And so 125 per thousand is huge. Uh, or per 100,000, I mean, that, that's huge. Yeah. So I was and just that's... wondering if that's something you guys calculated out in Huntington and Charleston or, you know. Sure. That so that was and there's is that was there's probably going to be uh, some bias in that also because of where our hospitals are located. Um, so that came from the perinatal partnership, and I can send that to you. Yeah, that would be great because it's it, that's an important number, but it's really hard to get. <laughs> yeah, this is broke broke. It was broken down by counties. Anybody else? I also see a couple other Baltieras on the call. If you make sure you put yourself in the chat there, uh, so we have you uh, marked down correctly, because there can only be one, right? So, um, I think they all have my link. And yeah, it's okay. Link with everybody out east, so sorry. It's all right. Yeah. Jennifer, can you um, provide the um, link for the last slide that you had? on the optimizing care of the baby and mother uh, triad. Yes, I will look for that. Thank you. And, and Jen or Jay, I think it's always ideal as people ask for these resources to be sent. I know Jay usually sends them out to everyone if that's if that's possible, Jen, for you to send them to Jay and then Jay, yep. Jay can disseminate them. Thank you. Sure. Another question from Dr. Baltiera. Go ahead and unmute and ask a question. Yeah, so Jen, one of the questions I've had is, is there anywhere that you know that we have data on, you know, mothers that are being delivered that already have treatment versus some that are not that's a pretty good would be a great measure of how successful we're being um you know in terms of getting treatment out to there i know i'm going to be looking at jefferson berkeley and morgan county um but i don't know if there's a statewide gut or appealing for that because at jefferson we deliver i think it's rare that we actually have a mom that comes in without treatment so that's pretty good but we're a pretty small county and our moms and dads room in. So that's, you know, we don't have anything like Lily's place or anything like that, but we we seem to have done okay on getting moms into treatment. And so I was just wondering if there's any statewide numbers on that. I, I don't know that we have those statewide, um, but the perinatal partnership together with, I believe five, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, five delivery hospitals in West Virginia, are uh, working on a quality improvement project um, to uh, essentially respond to positive screens at delivery and collect information from mom prior to discharge. And from that, I know that we um, have, have some information about how many of our moms are in a program. I believe, now I, I might conflate this so I can look it up and send it to Jade for dissemination late, later, but for our area, around a third of our moms are in treatment. Um, but that includes all substances. Uh, I would say likely more of our moms that are uh, testing positive for opioids, maybe more than a third of them are in treatment. But if you include marijuana and, and all illicit substances, it's about a third. Time for one more question. And yes, Jen, just send me any information you have and I'll make sure to get it out to the, to the group.
All right. Well, then we will move on if there's not any other questions. Jennifer, thanks again for the presentation and uh, the questions. So we will share any additional information we come up with along with the training and the stats and everything that's been asked here. Those will be in the recap email. So be on the look for those. All right, Laura, I will share my screen and pull up the case and then you can take it away. Thanks. So I wanted to share this case because it's actually, um, it just feels like it's it's a fairly common experience um, and one I wanted to, you know, see if the group felt was familiar and if any folks have strategies for, for working with um, patients who present in this way. So this was a, a young woman who, um, her first point of contact was really in the hospital when she um, presented to the emergency room having um, some preterm labor and, and anxiety. Um, and then she was admitted onto the floor for delivery. So she's 22 years old uh, and white Medicaid uh, patient. And um, she received some prenatal care, although not at our institution. And so she didn't have a lot of records with us. She was not in any treatment prior to delivery. So primary um, substance of choice was methamphetamines, and she was also using um, uh, Suboxone non-prescribed, uh, and then also she was prescribed benzodiazepines. So this was, for most of the course of her pregnancy, that was what she was, was taking. Uh, long history of substance use since her teenage years and was in and out of juvenile placement. Uh, both parents struggled with substance use disorder, um, and her father was currently in jail for charges related to his substance use disorder, and her mother had died when she was uh, in kind of later adolescence. So no doubt history of trauma, one can surmise from, from the background. Um, and then she also had uh, some domestic violence in her current partnership with um, the father of her baby. And that was sort of historical context for what was to come. She did deliver vaginally um, and it was a full term um, delivery and the baby was healthy. Uh, this is her first baby. She tried to breastfeed in the hospital, but as you can imagine, um, Child Protective Services fairly quickly became involved um, and then there was a separation. So kind of speaking to what Jen mentioned about trying to keep mom and baby together, and sometimes that's not possible because of Child Protective Services circumstances, and it's very common for mom and baby to then be separated. And then what we often see, as, as happened in this case, uh, we see the baby develop some more significant uh, symptoms of, of neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is what happened. So mom left the hospital, could not see the baby anymore, and baby finished out the stay um, in, in the NICU. Mother was immediately referred to uh, treatment for um, or opioid use disorder for medication uh, with us in our pregnancy clinic. So as you can imagine, her first uh, her first group with us, she was barely able to speak. She was in tears. Um, she was just so sad that she had been separated, had tremendous amount of guilt and shame around um, her, her own use, but she was also pretty defended because um, this is, you know, a young lady who's been through a lot in her life and developed her own coping skills. So she was not like a vulnerable person, even though she was crying, she was, she was upset. Uh, I really worried about whether she would stick with us in treatment. Um, yeah. However, she, excuse me, she turned out to actually be highly motivated. Um, you can scroll down a, a little bit, Jay. She did have um, hepatitis C as just a comorbid medical condition. Um, and um, her, her urine drug screen was consistent with what she was reporting. Is that all of it? I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember. That is, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, um, so in terms of just questions for the group, just thoughts about yeah. strategies for um, engaging a mom kind of in this position in treatment where the efforts to keep mom and baby together were not possible, even though we know that that's ideal, were, were not possible because the baby was removed from her custody. 
um, and any modality or setting that might be best. Um, and this has often come up also, and I didn't know what other people's experiences were with child protective services and moms who are trying to breastfeed, pumping and giving uh, their breast milk to the foster family. If that's ever been successful, we've talked about it. And I've had mothers that were very motivated to do this, but we've ne I've never been successful in, in being able to get the breast milk to, to the baby who's in, in foster care. Um, and then just any, any thoughts about best chances for success for your reunification um, as she like then goes back into the same community in the same setting where she was actively using substances and attempts um, to, to be abstinent with the support of uh, treatment. So really just soliciting thoughts or, or uh, recommendations or experiences. So Laura, a question for your physicians. Were they comfortable letting this mom's breast milk be given to this baby, particularly, you know, once they're separated? And then I can follow up why I had had some concerns about that. Yeah, it was it was surprising to us because usually any positive urine screen uh, would prohibit that. Um, and I wanted to sort of throw that in there to see if anyone caught that um, that would absolutely be a reason that Child Protective Services would not um, basically allow uh, mom to to give the babies the, the, the breast milk. Um, and so usually um, substances and then THC is a little bit of a prescribed, like prescribed benzodiazepines would be a little bit of a gray area. THC is sometimes a gray area, but methamphetamines is usually um, a pretty hard stop no. So it was unclear what, how that occurred in, in our system. Yeah, because I mean, usually my concern would be if mom's on suboxone or buprenorphine treatment, you've got a steady dose and you know what they're taking. When mom's using um, intermittently, even if she's taking a huge baby's getting, and, um, and as you guys have probably seen, there's so much in what patients are taking, there's just no way to know. And so that could be a risk to to the baby. So I, I think the situation is not a matter of not supporting her breastfeeding. It's, it's potentially contraindicated, I think, you know, medically to Definitely. provide that baby with that breast milk. Which is bad, you know, sad because we want her to be participating and stuff. Right, right. Were there other factors that they took custody of this baby that quickly and not put it in family care? Because usually on a first time mom, and again, I think every county is different, we tend to see they tend to look for family members to connect them unless there's some pretty significant circumstances. Yeah, this was a young lady who, you know, her mother was deceased, her, her father was incarcerated, and the father's parents um, already had custody of his children, uh, so they weren't sort of willing to take um, another. Um, and so um, there was there was no family available, yeah. So I think just in terms of en engagement, this is a this is a time when we often just like Jen was kind of talking about the postpartum period be, period being a high time for relapse, having a child removed from their custody is a high time for for relapse. And so thinking about um, we worked really hard to to engage her because she did have a sense that she was angry. There was this whole thing about prescribed benzodiazepines and us explaining to her that in our program, she couldn't remain on benzodiazepines. And she was sort of upset about that because she was extremely anxious, understandably, and uh, felt that she needed them at, at that point. Uh, so it was, it was a little bit of a struggle to engage her uh, in the beginning. Laura, there was a question in the chat from Rhonda about, is there a chance for reunification? Yeah, so I can, I can 
I can fast forward uh, to give people the update on on this patient and Amanda knows her as well. Um, so one of the things we did is we got her into individual therapy really quickly because she was pretty shut down in group, although the group members and we did you know have a group modality as as the primary intervention in our in our co program. The group members were so good because it can it can be questionable as to whether there will be some judgment from peers about you used your entire entire pregnancy like what's wrong with you so sometimes that does happen um the group did not do that the group was totally supportive of her really cheerleading her about you can do this you can get your baby back very encouraging um usually for a first time mom there is that that possibility so that felt accurate in in our experience uh so um, I felt, you know, that was appropriate for the, the patients to be cheering uh, her on in, in, in that regard. Um, so the group modality turned out to be great, but she was really quiet. So we did some, uh, some individual work, certainly lots of trauma. Uh, I was, she, this young lady actually exceeded my expectations in that she grew up in a family she had always lived in an environment where there was active substance use. She had never really experienced a home without active substance use. So for her to sort of do this at 22, um, where she was able to create that environment and she actually successfully has and is about to get her kids back. Um, one of the things that set them back was this domestic violence charge from during like she was probably in her second trimester when the charge occurred both of them were using actively and she tried to say he would never do that if he hadn't been using but um, it did delay um, some progress that they may have had they had to separate for a period of time which was also very hard on both of them um, but but they're moving towards reunification at, at this time she was amazingly she was able to really recall some of the skills that she learned in juvenile detention around management of anxiety. Um, she got very engaged with her. Her CPS worker was tremendously supportive, which we don't always see. Um, and that made a huge difference as was her parenting, uh, the, the individual doing her parenting intervention she felt was absolutely supportive and on her side. So again, like multiple systems coming together and working you know, together can can really help with the engagement process is what I saw. Any other questions or comments? I, I would just want to add, um, I like more what you had to say about the group kind of being the, the group milieu being the intervention uh, in terms of, of helping to support her. It it can be really difficult to create Shoot. but it, it is challenging to um hold hold space for the group to come together like that so that they can support one another. Yeah, and I've encountered so many of our, our moms do have experiences with Child Protective Services and some are, are good and some are not good. Um, and I, over the years, I have struggled with it turning into like a CPS bashing session, which is completely unhelpful for anyone, nor does it instill any hope. Um, and so I've, I've had to cultivate skills about how to redirect that conversation and really draw out the individuals who have had some success so that we can we can cultivate some hope although again as as jennifer pointed out in in her presentation sometimes the the chance for unification may not be there and so we don't want to um we don't want to pretend that that's really the goal if that's not possible um and so you know evaluating the the situation based on you know previous um removals or terminations is, is really important to present like an accurate, uh, you know, an accurate picture of what's possible for the patient. Well, 
Let's see, Dr. Baltier, does anyone have experience working with CPS before birth in setting up a plan of safe care? So in theory, that is supposed to be what we're doing <laughs> under CAPTA and the CARA Act. Um, I would say the closest uh, we've gotten in my health system is if, if someone is in Project Hope, so they're in a residential setting uh, within a healthcare system that has like all of the services that they or their child can possibly need, and they're going to be there for an extended period of time, sometimes they will listen to us. Um, but for outpatient, that's that's never happened. It, it's actually, I've had a hard time getting people to even verify that they're in my program. So I have to give the patient their packet of data so that they can give that to their worker themselves. Because the legis or the law actually says we should be doing that. And so kind of with this group here, how do we push, you know, CPS? To, you know, right now, as Laura said, everybody views it as very punitive, where it shouldn't be. It should be kind of a, a collaborative providing services to these families before birth, as opposed to making an assessment. And, and you know, again, we've all got our experiences, criticisms, good, bad stories of CPS, but ideally, these are families at risk, and they should be assessed on that risk as a whole. The drug use is only a part of that risk. And sometimes, you know, family, you know, it's just a marker of risk. And so they, I, I would have no problem if these families were followed and supported for a year postpartum, but they're basically triaged and, you know, decide, yes, yeah, you're in or you're out. You keep your baby or you don't. And it really is a lot deeper. And I think everybody here probably knows that. I'm sure, you know, Jennifer, you and Laura, that, you know, experience with that, but it really is how do we, you know, it's been on the books for a while, but we can't, same as you guys, it really would be nice to say, okay, this patient needs these support systems, they need these antepartum support, and they're already in a program, or they're not, or, you know, you know, like, Laura, like your patient, she needs extra support, you know, to get her into the, you know, treatment, to deal with all her other issues, or, you know, many women in that situation say, why bother, I lost my baby, I'm not going to go, you know, I have no motivation to, to, be in recovery in so that sense that engagement is real important. So anyway, just kind of putting in a plug to, I don't know how we get there, but it doesn't sound like anybody else in the state has had success either with that. Uh, Dr. Baltier, this is Janine. We're all with the West Virginia Perinatal Partnership. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll say several years ago, we were really pushing mm -hmm. to do a pilot project around um, with some of our drug-free moms and baby sites with, you know, doing the plan, creating those plans of safe care and having all that in place. And, you know, of course, then the thought was that we could show because all these programs are doing what the law intends, um, which is to get that in place and help um, ensure that only CPS is only intervening in those cases where it's absolutely necessary. And, um, just honestly, it just people were on board, but the state was just having trouble getting policy out and making a decision. And we've just kind of lost the momentum. I'm happy to go back and revisit that. We, we just finished a survey of all the delivery hospitals around, you know, what are you doing about plans of safe care? And not surprisingly, a lot of the delivery hospitals are like, what are you talking about? I've never heard of that. So I think there is a lot of work in the space and you guys are in the best position to sort of, you know, be pushing for it. So. I think that the hard thing is, is there's been times where I have tried to get them in contact in advance and the state will actually kick back and be like, yeah, we don't want to hear about this until after the baby's born, um, which makes it very difficult. And there's also that fear, I think, on the on the client side, where if you get them involved earlier, and then it's almost just like like I've had a lot of hesitation brought up from clients who are like, I don't want you to reach out to them until we absolutely have to. I don't want to be on their radar in advance. And again, it, it stems from that punitive place. One thing that I think can be helpful sometimes too, if you know there are needs like housing needs or something like that, that's going to be brought up by CPS at the time, if you can take care of that while mom is pregnant and 
take that stressor off of her too, so that um, that is something that is already taken care of. And um, even though it might not be technically part of the plan of safe care, it's something that we know they're going to need after delivery that CPS is gonna be looking at. Great comments, everybody. Really appreciate it. Keep them coming. Um, we are two minutes after the session, so we just want to be mindful of everybody's time. But thank you to uh, Laura for the case presentation and everybody with their questions and comments. This has been great. Um, just as a reminder, as we're wrapping up here, we'll meet here in October. Uh, we will be in touch with what the topic and speaker is. So if you have any other ideas, please uh, send them my way. Um, and then also, Jennifer, I saw you put the links in the chat. Those will be in the recap email as well. And we will be in touch. Everybody have a great week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.